Should we pay pastors? Or should they make tents like Paul did? In other words, have a real job. What does the New Testament really say about this? Stay tuned to find out. Now there's this idea that gets around that says that a pastor should have a real job while still doing their ministry. I mean, Paul used to make tents, after all, and so therefore a pastor should have a real job while doing their ministry. But is this really the case? Well, the answer is no, but let me explain to you why. Now, to understand what Paul did, and especially why he made tents, we have to understand the sort of profession that Paul had. Paul was a teacher. That was his profession. And in order to make sense of what that meant for him, we need to first of all understand what it meant to be a teacher in the ancient world, especially how it was that a teacher got paid. The first way was through student fees. Now, a student or a teacher would gather together students and have a class with them for a year or for several years, and they would be paid at the end of the year. So there was one payday for the entire year, and that would be determined by the parents. The parents would say, well, I feel like you've done a good enough job with my son, and so I'll pay you X amount. Another way was to travel around. So you would travel from town to town and you would teach as you go. And when you came to the town, you would find a patron. You would find somebody who would support you, who would house you, who would feed you. And for the person who put you up for the time you were there, that was a great honor for them. They would have the honor to say, hey, that teacher that came to town is staying with me. I'm the one who's getting to look after this particular person. A third way is that you would become a client to a patron. What this meant was, was that you would have find somebody who was a wealthy patron and they would literally employ you to be their teacher. Now, the way that it works in the ancient world is that a wealthy patron would have lots of people who are dependent on them. And that was a mark of honor. There's lots of people who I support, I provide for their various needs. Uh, that's because I'm rich and I'm generous. Again, for the patron, this was a mark of honor. And for the teacher, it was an income. It was a steady means of support. Uh, it was housing, it was clothing, it was food, it was money. It was everything they required to make a living. And interestingly, we see all of these play out in the New Testament. One of the places that we see this happening is with Jesus and the 12 disciples. In Luke 8, 8 verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus traveled from one city and village to another. He spread the good news about God's kingdom. The 12 apostles were with him. Also, some women were with him. These women were Mary, also called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was Herod's administrator, Susanna, and many other women. They provided financial support for Jesus and his disciples. And so this is one of those circumstances where we find a patron taking the financial responsibility for a teacher. Now, it's a little bit different. The way that it would work typically is that a patron would have a teacher as a part of their clientele, but they would effectively be their boss. They would be able to say to the teacher, you go here, you do this. We, we, I effectively own you because you're one of my employees. I can tell you where to go and what to do at my will because if you don't like that, I'll stop paying you. You can go and find somebody else to support you. So there's a sense of ownership at work there. What we find here in, with this circumstance with Jesus, it's a little bit different. We find that Jesus is obviously the leader of the group, but he and the other 12 disciples who are doing the teaching and the ministry need support. They're not fishing anymore. They're not tax collecting anymore. They're not doing the things that they used to do to make a living. Now they're full-time in ministry. They need support. And so these women have come along to serve as their patrons, to serve as, to provide the financial needs of the particular group. But we, we actually see a, a second instance uh, only a couple of chapters later in Luke 10. So Luke 10, 3 says, Go. I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. So in this circumstance, we find the second type of support that a teacher could rely on. That was to go into uh, a village or into a town and find somewhere to stay while they were there. And there would always always have been plenty of people who would be willing to have a teacher come and stay with them, again, for the honor that that would bring 
to them of having that person come and stay with them. All right, so what about Paul? What about Paul and his tent making? Now, I say that with scare quotes because Paul was a tent maker amongst many other things that he could do. Paul's trade, in fact, was a leather worker. Uh, Paul had the skill of being able to work with leather, and so all sorts of leather goods could be produced. Uh, Paul would have been proficient at making bags and sandals and horse saddles and a- any number of things that were made out of leather. That would have been Paul's trade. And so we see this leather working play out in a couple of different ways occasions. The first one is in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. He says, as you know, we never used flattery or schemes to make money. God is our witness. We didn't seek praise from people, from you or from anyone else, although as apostles of Christ, we had the right to do this. Paul's saying to the Thessalonians here, you actually should have paid us. We had a right as apostles to demand this from you. He says the same thing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9. As apostles, we have the right to be paid. As the ministers in this Christian community, we have the the right to be able to demand from that community to whom we're working to be supported by you. Now, it's a reciprocal blessing. You support us through your work and through your labor, and in return, we provide for you the spiritual sustenance that you need as Christians. And so we could have demanded that from you. It is a right that we have as a part of this community. However, we didn't do it. Why? Well, he says he goes on in verse 7. We were like young children amongst you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Now, we saw in last week's video that people in the first century are living at subsistence level poverty. People don't have enough finances to support themselves, to support their children, let alone other people. The only way that you can support another person is when the whole community rallies together with the tiny little bit that they might have in excess, pull all of that together, they might just be able to come up with enough to support another person. These are the people Paul's preaching to. They don't have enough to support themselves, let alone him, and Paul recognizes this. Paul's not going to come into that community and say, hey, I'm the apostle, you need to pay me. Oh, I don't care if you can't feed your children, you need to pay me because I'm more important. That's just not something Paul's going to do. He says, no, 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 I worked to support myself because there's no way you could have supported me. So the reason Paul didn't, the reason Paul made tents in Thessalonica, again, was simply that they didn't have the money to support him in the first place. It was just as simple as that. But we find a similar thing happening in Corinth. And this is the passage, I think, where we get this idea from that that pastors should make tents on top of their ministry. The story we find is in Acts 18, verse 1. It says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker or a leather worker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So in this particular context, um, Paul chose to make tents again. Paul chose to do his leather working. Now, the situation here is a little bit different in Corinth. Corinth was a bit of a wealthier city. Certainly the Corinthian Christians, some of them, seemed to have a little bit of extra wealth. In fact, so much so that what seems to have happened is that when Paul got there, some of the Corinthians had said to Paul, hey, why don't you be our client? Why don't you be our personal pastor? We'll support you, we'll provide for you, we'll give you a house and food and whatever else you need, but you can effectively work for us. Effectively, we can own you, is is what they were offering to Paul. Now, in any other context, that's fine. Teachers were very happy to be a client to to these patrons if it meant that they didn't have to worry about where their next meal was coming from. Paul, on the other hand, says, "I, I can't do that. My calling my obligation is to everybody, to slaves, to free, to Jews, Gentiles, males, females, everybody I'm obligated to. And if I'm owned by you, I can't be free to preach to everybody else. So thank you for the offer, but no thanks as well. I'd much rather go and do the work of supporting myself, making tents, doing leather working, so that I don't have to be obligated to one particular person within the community. 
The story goes on. Verse 5 says, When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, this is a verse that we often miss when we're insisting that pastors have to make tents in order to support themselves. What changed when Silas and Timothy arrived? Well, they came from Macedonia, and it says that Paul was able to devote himself to full-time preaching. Again, what changed? Well, as we find out later on, the Macedonians had actually sent support with, with Silas and Timothy to provide for Paul's needs so that he could preach full-time, so that he wouldn't have to do the work of leatherworking. Paul didn't want to do the leatherworking because it took up the time that he could have been using preaching to the city. He didn't want to be stuck in a workshop. He needed to be out in the marketplace preaching the gospel. Now he was able to do that because these Macedonians had said, we'll support you, no strings attached, right? We're not going to own you. We're going to be almost like a mission, missionary offering. We'll send you out. We'll support and provide your needs so long as in return you just do the work of Christ. We can't do what you can do, Paul, but we can help support you in order to do it. And so it's a very different set of circumstances. The Corinthians have said, we'll support you, but we'll own you. The Macedonians have said, we'll support you, just go and preach the gospel. Do whatever you can and we'll support you in any way that we can in return. Completely different offering, completely different set of circumstances. But importantly, what we notice is that the minute Paul could put down his leatherworking, he absolutely did, because now he could find support with no strings attached. So what are the principles for us today? Well, first of all, churches do have an obligation to support their ministers. It's a job like any other, and the means of support comes from the people who are being blessed by that person's ministry. So absolutely, there is a an obligation, a fundamental responsibility of the churches to support their pastors. However, it shouldn't come with any strings. If it comes with an attitude of, oh, we'll support you, pastor, but we'll own you, well, that's unhealthy. That's, that's exactly what Paul rejected and voluntarily went and worked so that he wouldn't have to be obligated to one particular sector of the community. But on the other hand, there was the recognition that if the community doesn't have the means to support the minister, then they shouldn't be expected to do so. You can only work within the means that you have. If you're a small church, if you've only got very limited resources, then you simply cannot. The math doesn't add up to be able to support a pastor. You can only do with what you have. And so there has to be a balance. It's not, we'll pay you, therefore we own you. At the same time, it's not the pastor saying, well, you're going to pay me even if it means your kids don't eat. Both of those are abusive. Both of those are very unchristian, very ungodly. What is healthy, however, is a church saying, we have X amount of means, you're our minister, and so we'll support you in any way that we possibly can because the blessing we get in return is the spiritual blessing that only you can provide. Well, I hope that's been helpful. Don't forget, if you want to go deeper on this topic, you can do that with the podcast. The link for that is in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can also do that through that same link. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. I hope that's been helpful and I'll see you next week. All the best.